they made two supers of honey. They made two supers of honey uh, on huh. day and then it an apple, and then it uh, cooled off and sprinkly for for a month and a half, and they didn't have, do anything on locust or sumac or honeysuckle or early clovers, and so they got something from basswood, and so we made a we made a reasonable crop, but it wasn't excellent. And then varroa got us again, and a lot of hives died from varroa after we thought they were pretty good. And, Anyway, so, you know, we're running a breeding program right now uh, with the university here in Vermont. And we're, we're in our second year. The next year will be the third year. And uh, we've done a lot, of, um, a lot of sampling and finding colonies that are keeping for all loads down, that are hygienic, that don't have uh, high nosema loads, you know, good producers wintering well. And we got to use the new um, the new assay assay looking for varroa sensitive uh, hygiene hygienic bees, um, and so we used that and we found some really nice candidates. So I don't know we're we're at least we're trying something other than putting junk in the hives to kill varroa mites, which we still have to do. But I don't know. After thirty years, I'd like to see it get better. But anyway. So my talk is the brood factory. Uh, wait a second here, I gotta do this. What is a brood factory? Well, a brood factory is any hive of bees that, um, whose really sole purpose in life is to make frames of combs of brood to be used in the apiary wherever it's needed. Um, yeah, any style beehive can be a brood factory. Of course, if you wanted a brood factory, you could you should have uh, the the comb size in the brood factory should be the same size as what you use in your apiaries. But other than that, gosh, yeah, Langstroth hives and top bar hives and Ware hives and anything that has a movable frame in it of whatever kind can uh, can be used as a brood factory, of course. Um, brood factories are nothing new. Um, I found a, a reference in a book um, that Brother Columban at Buckfast Abbey, who is Brother Adam's mentor, um, in 1900 devised a beehive that held four nucleus colonies. And his idea was as they increased in strength, he would remove excess brood and give it to his honey producing colonies thereby boosting the population of the honey producing colonies, you know, increasing the honey crop. Our brood, our brood factories and resource hives the same. Well, if you look in the, uh, the bee supply catalogs, you'll see resource hives uh, advertised. Um, it's sort of a copy of what I do, but the bottom is a, a, a divided deep um, bottom board has an entrance on either end uh, for one nuke, you know, opposite ends. Um, they have uh, little supers that go on top, half width supers that meet on top of the divider. So you're really creating two separate chambers. Um, and the problem I have with uh, most, most education about resource hives and um, about the uh, the catalogs that sell resource hives is, you know, they, they encourage that you have a resource hive, good thing, um, and that you let it build up, and then you can use it in the apiary where it's needed. So if you had a hive that went queenless, or you have a hive that needs to be requeened, or you have a drone layer, or you have something, something happened, you can unite the resource hive with the colony that's having issues and save that colony. So it's one resource hive saves one hive in your apiary. Well, I hope by the end of this talk that you realize that brood factories to me, to, for me are way, way more than a one-to-one -one thing, more than 
one resource hive saves one beehive. So, in fact, I think they are the backbone of my my apiary and the and the foundation. And I I could go on and on about it. So, a number of years ago, I I drew this triangle, and at each uh, corner of the triangle. I had a different uh, different kind of uh, beehive, um, different use, whatever. Um, on the top were the production colonies, the honey producing colonies. Um, lower left are the nucleus colonies and lower right were the mating nuclei. So really they, the reason they're, they're connected is because they all support each other. You know, the production colonies give breeding stock to the mating nuclei the mating nuclei um, give queens to the nucleus colonies and the nucleus colonies support the production colonies. When you lose them or they're weak or whatever, you can requeen them. Or, or if you have dead hives, they, re, they restock the dead hive and so forth. Well, I realized recently that, no, it's actually, yes, they all support each other, but it's the brood factories that support that each one. Whereas the brood factories are, are donating brood for making production colonies, uh, making uh, cell building colonies, making nucleus colonies. So this whole thing works together and um, it all supports the, uh, the whole, the whole system supports the apiary. And that's why to me, this is truly a sustainable plan for beekeeping. So why do I keep these uh, brood factories in nucleus colony configuration, meaning vertical configuration? Langstroth hives, for instance, 10 frame hives or top bar hives, or they're all horizontally configured. And for the bees to expand the, say the brood nest, they have to expand outward, but they can't expand outward till they have more bees. And there's combs out there that could be occupied and, and brood raised in them, but they have to get out there and warm them and polish them and clean them for the queen and, and have population to cover them. But they don't have that yet. So it's slow going to expand horizontally. <coughs> but to expand vertically, my, my boxes only hold four combs, each nuke. And so there's not a heck of a lot of horizontal expansion onto, onto cold combs there. So they have to expand vertically and heat rises. And so they're always expanding upward onto warm combs. So it's pretty amazing how fast they can crank out frames of brood when horizontally configured hives seem to have that block of, of not enough population. So another reason I like to keep them in a nucleus uh, configuration is the vertical configuration, yes, but more queens laying requiring fewer resources. So if you, if you think about it, my 10 frame box thing, uh, footprint um, has two queens laying, whereas a 10 frame Langstroth would have one queen laying, one, one bottom board, one box, maybe two more than one box of 10 frame equipment, you know, an inner cover, an outer cover, or however you configure your hives for one queen laying. I can have one bottom board and one outer cover with, a, with either a bag or, or two little inner covers on top. And I can stack them up, you know, four or five high, they're cranking up brood all the time. And there's two of them in a, in a footprint, not one. And also handling their, their weight. I mean, just to be able to handle um, these brood factories. And the heaviest box you'll ever have is probably 25 pounds. If there were four full combs of brood up there, I mean, uh, excuse me, of honey up there. So it's not like uh, handling uh, hive bodies and supers full of honey. 
we use these nucleus colonies for boosting weak colonies, um, strengthening cell builders, and starting nucleus colonies. So boosting weak and slow colonies, I, I shouldn't put that word weak in there. I don't think that's right. You know, a weak colony might be sick. It's got a failing queen. There's a reason for it to be weak. A slow colony maybe has a good queen. It got a late start, you know, um, and they're just lagging behind everybody. And that's what I'm talking about. So years ago, I coined a phrase, the bee bomb. And if you think about it, if you took a slow colony and took it off the bottom board and put a box of brood on the bottom board, emerging brood or whatever, from harvested from your brood factories, you know, five, six, eight combs of brood, and you put your slow colony back on top, what would happen? What would the population of that colony be in, say, two weeks? It would explode like somebody dropped a bee bomb on it. And so that's that's how I boost weak colonies, slow colonies in uh, you know, at, at any time of the year, really. And so imagine if you start putting in five or six frames of brood like this in a colony that could use it. My goodness, how many frames, uh, how many bees would there be there in two weeks? It'd be incredible. Then of course, if you're helping a slow colony, there's a reason it's a slow colony. As long as it's not brood, it's probably the queen when other colonies are performing well. <clears throat> and so the queen, the, the, co the colony probably should be requeened at some date when queens are available. But you help the, you help the slow colonies when they need it, and then you requeen them later. <clears throat> but where does all that brood come from? From helping all your slow colonies? It comes from brood factories where you can harvest brood as needed. How about strengthening cell builders? You know, when you build make cell builders, you want you want wicked powerful colonies to make make good queen cells. Something like this. So the picture on the um, on the left. Um, <clears throat> The bottom three boxes, two deeps and a medium, that's my standard overwintered, overwintering brood nest. That's their chamber right there. Until I put honey supers on, that's what they live in. And um, so about the end of April, um, I put a couple of medium supers on. And then when we start cell building, the, the first cell builders are set up uh, May 9th, just about every year. <clears throat> I check the, the the colony for queen cells, make sure there's no swarm cells or anything in it. I put a queen excluder between the two medium supers, making sure the queen is in the bottom. I can shake all the bees out on the ground in front and then put it back on so there won't be any queen up there. And then I harvest emerging brood from the brood factories. This is actually the cell building yard and there's 60 some brood factories right over here to the right that you can't see. And we'll see if some right there, maybe. <clears throat> and so each of these um, cell builders, these future cell builders, are going to get two frames of honey, one on the outside uh, wall of each side, and seven frames of emerging brood. This brood has to be emerging brood. You know, if we don't see it actively emerging, we'll open up some cappings and see what a, what stage are the pupae at? Are they purple eye? They're too young. I want them to be emerging now because we're going to be grafting into this cell builder in 10 days. And I want those, uh, what is the age of the age of proper nurse bees is somewhere 10 days. 10, 12, 14 days, somewhere in there. So we're trying to grow the population of nurse bees by giving this future cell building unit emerging brood. And then on grafting day, I'll remove the super and the, and the brood, the brood which is now all capped, right? There's no eggs, there's no larvae, it's been 10 days. That's going to be my cell builder. 
So I remove that from the hive. I put the hive, I turn the hive around and put it on the ground facing backwards. I put a new, new bottom board down. I put the medium on the bottom board. I put the deep on the medium. I take out the two frames of honey and make a space in the middle, big enough for two combs. I put a pollen comb in. And later on, the other space will be the graft. I shake the nurse bees out of the queen right section. Here it is behind through a queen excluder. There's on the left, there's my queen excluder shaker box over there on the left photo. And that gives me, uh, it filters out any queens that might be, that might get shook in. So I, you can't have a queen in there. And I come back in a couple of hours later to put the graft in and look at that. I mean, there are so many bees. So they got the majority of the of the nurse bees from the queen right section. Uh, they've got all the field bees because you, it's on the original stand facing the original direction. So they got all the resources they could ever possibly use. They got all the nurse bees that they could ever possibly use. And, you know, quality queen cells, uh, to me, it's about the jelly. It's about how much jelly are fed to the larvae and the pupae before they spin their little cocoon. If you maximize the amount of jelly, you maximize the quality of the queen and you get queen cells like these. So these are about day six after graft. We put them in the hive around day 10. But look at the jelly. I mean, they're just packed, packed with jelly. So how do you maximize the amount of royal jelly in the queen cells? By increasing the nurse bee population, by adding emerging brood to the cell builders. And where does that brood come from? You bet, it comes from brood factories. It doesn't come from, uh, from production hives, rendering production hives non-productive. It comes from brood factories, which are disposable or dispensable or whatever. How about starting nucleus colonies? So we start a lot of nucleus colonies here. Pretty good for a Northern climate like this um, and, and our limited time and limited numbers. So we usually somewhere- We're not going out right now. I'm doing something. We'll go out later. Please mute, mute yourself. But anyway, um, so we start somewhere between 300 and 350 nucleus colonies. Um, we start making nucleus colonies when the first queens are ready. So that's the middle of June and we got to get done before the middle of July. So we have about a month. We have about five weeks maybe to make nucleus colonies. And then the season is, it's done, you know? And so, uh, you know, we have to do it fast. And we make whole apiaries of nucleus colonies, whole apiaries. And where does the brood come from? Of course it does. It comes from brood factories. You know, all the brood needed to make 300, 350 nucleus colonies and all the queens that we raise to go in those nucleus colonies and many, many extras, all that brood comes from brood factories. Without my brood factories, I don't know what I'd do. I wouldn't make any honey because I'd have to split up my, my honey production colonies. So how I got started with brood factories, well, I needed brood to start cell builders and create nucleus colonies. And at first, um, at first I would do something like this. I would take a non-productive hive um, when other colony, when other hives are just rolling in honey and I'd sacrifice it. I'd break it down and get rid of the queen. And whatever bees and brood I had in there, I would use to make nucleus colonies or cell builders, right? And that was okay when I was only making some. I wasn't doing so much at first. So I had enough, but eventually I wanted more. I wanted to make more nucleus colonies so that I didn't have the, the brood and bees I needed from non-productives. So I'd start having to start sacrificing uh, production on honey production colonies. Well, that's not good. So harvesting brood from honey production colonies. So here's a yard with some uh, some honey on it. 
um, surely weigh more than uh, than 100 pounds a hive. And I want to pull some brood for making nucleus colonies. So here's number seven. It's got four supers of honey on top. That's 100, 150 pounds. I don't know. It depends how full they are. So I'm going to take that 150 pounds of honey off. And I'm going to pull some brood out to make a, a make a nuke. A couple frames of brood and a honey and, and, and put all that honey back on top. That's not going to happen. That happened when I was 30. That's not going to happen when I'm 70. <laughs> you know, there's no way. So I had to come up with a different plan. Because that's just, that was too much work. Well, when I wintered nucleus colonies, um, I used to winter them in uh, singles, single story, four columns with a movable divider feeder. And um, some would would be weak. And so I'd use the strong ones and I'd let the weak ones build up. I'd move the feeder over to the sidewall and give them four more combs and let them build up and then use those those uh, resources of that weaker colony as they built up to make nucleus colonies. Well, a lot of times there's a reason why it's an, it's a weak colony. You know, if it was just the queen was a punk, then I, then it wouldn't matter. But so many of them were full of chalk brood and, and just had real issues. You can't make nucleus colonies out of chalk brood. So that kind of put a li limit on that. So I thought, well, maybe I'll just oh, uh, sacrifice the good ones and I'll let them build up a little and make some nucleus colonies. So that's what I did. I started with nice, strong, overwintered nucleus colonies in, in two stories, two, two nukes in a box, right? The bottom box is divided. It's got a divider right here. And and each side has its own entrance. This one, this side has this one, and that side has over there. And so this is dandelion time, about 10th of May, middle of May. Look at the bees already. These things overwintered, came through my winter. Their first pollen is probably the middle of April. There's no pollen. First cleansing flight might be the beginning of April all the way since November. And look at them. I mean, they, <laughs> they winter exceptionally well. And so in 2011, the first year I had um, brood factories, I had 50 overwintered nucleus colonies that I devoted to the plan here. On May 9th, I started uh, pulling brood um, to stock cell builders. So over that time, May 9 to June 19, I was able to create 35 cell builders with seven frames of brood each. So that's 245 frames of brood. And then in uh, June 16th, I switched over to making nucleus colonies. See, there's a little overlap there. I switched over to making nucleus colonies. And until July 20th, I made 330 nucleus colonies. So I made all the queens for the 330 nucleus colonies. <clears throat> Now, I'll have to say that I never was able to repeat those numbers again. That, that's pretty exceptional that you got. I got 900 and something frames of brood out of, um, out of 50 nukes um, in this vertical configuration. And partly because I sacrificed those 50 nucleus colonies. They were gone. I got rid of the queens or whatever. And I used up all the brood and bees, and I had nothing left of those 50, although I did have my 330. So that was a plan. I could do that. I could restock 50 and save 50 for next year and do it again and again. But I kind of thought that was pretty wasteful. So the following year, I did something a little more conservatively and sustainably. I started with an apiary of strong nucleus colonies and I added frames to them. Now, before I start going into that, I just wanted to say there's a key, a color key um, of the frames of the, of the slides I use. And you can see each, uh, each what, whatever's in the comb is what uh, the color designates. So the yellow is honey, and then you got the emerging, the caps, the mixed brood. Mixed brood would be eggs, larvae, and some capped but it has open brood on it. Nectar pollen, empty comb foundation. So it's gonna be a colorful little thing. So 
So this is um, this is the double nuke box, single story double nuke box when we make them up. And this is basically how we make them up with enough bees. And the gray, this is a double nuke box. So the gray stripe in the middle is the divider. It's just the central divider. So I'm just I'm just giving you a, a, an idea of what it looks like, what I'm gonna talk about. And so overwintered nucleus colonies, double nukes, two-story hive, two stories high, look something like this. You know, I have a one has two frames of honey, the other has one left. You know, we're talking about end of April, beginning of um, beginning of May, before the flow really starts. Sometimes we get some maple in uh, in April, and they each one they have a little bit different as far as um, honey as brood goes. But you can see the the left one's got uh, three caps, three frames of cap brood and one mixed. And the one on the right's got uh, three mixed and two caps. So they they vary a little bit. And the one on the right's got an empty comb in the bottom. That's that figures on the outside. That figures. So that's sort of what it's going to look like. So if I wanted to add um, a third story, see these are in two. And I need to build them up. I can't leave them in two, especially if I'm going to have them be in these configurations all summer to pull brood out and all. I have to add more boxes. And the way we add the boxes is uh, so we got a two story hive nuke, and we want to put a third story on it. And I could put a box on top with four combs, four empty brood combs. And, but we're on a, but I want brood, you know, I want the bees to be uh, drawing out, uh, filling up combs of brood. So if I put their empty combs up on the top on a honey flow, what do you figure is going to happen? Most likely they're going to put nectar up there. So you have to have a way to get her to lay in those combs. Well, you can see where I put my empty combs. I have four empty combs. I put two in the center box against the divider, and I put two in the top box against the outside wall. Why do I do it that way? Where is the where is the center of the brood nest of these double nuke boxes? You know, provided there's a there's a nuke on both sides, this center divider becomes a warm a warm area. And so the two combs uh, against the divider become the center of the brood nest. And so if you put two combs there, now look, there's there's combs there's combs of brood below and next to and above. So those two combs are surrounded by brood. You put those there, and that queen is going to jump right on those combs. And then the two empty combs can go on the outside, the, the, the remaining two. And yes, they're going to get um, nectar put there because that's they're in the prime spot. They're in the top box on the outside. <clears throat> so that's how we expand them into, the, into three boxes. But I'm going to get rid of one box. It's too confusing to have two. So I'm going to get rid of one side and just leave it blank. So this is what it looks like after I added the third box. And we get them built up pretty well. This is uh, uh, the beginnings of a um, brood factory yard. Um, you can see a couple, three or three or four of them already have four four stories high. They they got strong early and they just needed room. And well, I got enough. I got to stay ahead of them, so it's better to put it on too soon than too late. So some of them got their fourth box, but that's sort of like what it looks like with a. Uh, with an expanding uh, apiary of nukes. So we're going to harvest brood for cell builders. So we start making uh, cell builders in, uh, in May, but we don't start making nukes until June. So this is the one that the, the double, the two story nuke that we added a story to, right? Empty combs on the divider at the divider, empty combs on the outside wall. 
So this is, uh, these are new uh, three-story uh, brood factories. Um, the one here on the far right is actually only two because it, it wasn't as strong as the others. So I had, to, I put a bag, a grain bag in between, a seed bag and an empty box so that the cover would stay level. And so I take the, uh, the left-hand nuke apart and I always do it the same way so I don't get confused. And so this is the top box, this is the middle box, and that's the lower box. Now I'm gonna go through, I wanna pull out uh, frames of honey and, and combs of emerging brood for my cell builders. And so it depends on what, what how strong this colony is, how much brood I take, and how much honey they have. If they have ample honey, I can take a comb of honey. Um, it, it depending on how strong they are. So, you know, I might take one frame of brood or two or sometimes even three and put the empty comb in that sweet spot, in that sweet spot, in the middle box. It goes right in there. Um, So you want to take enough brood so that they uh, don't swarm, but you don't want to take uh, so much that they dwindle. So it's it's sort of an experience thing. You got to learn learn your bees, and you know you have to realize how fast they'll expand in these things. The one on the right has uh, was a little bit weak before, but it's not it's not weak anymore, is it? So. I'll probably take a frame or two out of that because it looks like they got kind of crowded because uh, we didn't have another third box on them. And so we we do that. We go around and, um, and you know, I have about, let's see, probably 100 or just over 100 brood factories. And so we, we go around. We start at the, at, the first, at the beginning on the first brood factory and we pull out brood and honey until we have enough for the day. And then we stop at that point and then four days later we come back and we start at that point and we continue down the rows and up and down and we go to the other yard and another brew factory yard and then when we're all done uh the last one we've got to it one, the first time we go back to the beginning and it's about every every 12 14 days we're back at the we're back to the beginning and we're going through so we're we're pulling out brood one two three frames of brood uh, one, if it's okay, if it can give it to me. Two, if they're nice, they're a nice one. If they're starting queen cells, if they're if there's a cup with an egg or anything like that, um, you have to clear the thing with uh, of any cups with eggs or jelly or anything like that, and really take some away. Take three or four maybe, and really give them a, a bunch of empty comb right in the middle of that sweet spot, so that discourages them from from swarming. So uh, Kate and, uh, and Tucker looking for, looking at the brood, making sure it's emerging, looking for the queen. Of course, you can't pull a queen out of a brood factory and put it in a cell builder. Boy, that's a disaster. You've just dequeened your brood factory and you just made your cell builder not a cell builder because they already have a queen. <clears throat> so you have to be pretty careful, but you get used to it. And we're pulling out things like whoops, we're pulling out combs like that, emerging. Um, this one's gone gone by a bit, but it's still got a bunch of bunch of nurse bees on it, feeding the larvae that are probably right in here. Then this is probably eggs, and then this is emerging brood. So and, we, and when we make these, when we pull the brood out, um, we leave the bees on it. You know, there's nothing you can you can move bees around between colonies and and they don't fight with each other. I don't know where that all came from, but they don't fight with each other. So the far left uh, slide is the same one after adding the comb. So then we're gonna ha harvest some emerging brood. So if you, look, uh, if you look at the progress of the combs, so the two empty combs that we put up on top, that's now honey or nectar. Up on top, there was a, uh, a, a mixed brood and a capped brood. Well, before we could get back there and, and look for emerging brood, it emerged. And so the queen laid in it. But the one next to it was a mixed brood. 
So by the time we got back to that one, that one's capped and it's starting to emerge. Same one down here that you see the two empty combs that got put in the uh, against the divider in that sweet spot. Now they're full of they're mixed brood. They're full of eggs and larvae and some capped. But the mixed brood right next to it again, it was old enough. So by the time we returned, it's emerging. So we'll pull those two frames of emerging brood and put an empty comb in their place and go on to the next next brood factory, which would be this one. And we'll do the same thing there. We'll pull what they can give us um, and, and add empty comb out of storage and then move on to the next one and, and, uh, and so on until we have enough for the day. So when we're making... Um, when we're making cell builders, um, we do four cell builders every four days from about May 9th until, oh, I think June 30th is the last cell builder was set up. And, um, and so we're using uh, seven frames of brood and two, and two honeys in each one. So that's uh, eight combs of honey and uh, what is it, 20... Uh, 20 28 combs of uh, emerging brood. Then we stop, and in four days, we start again. And we keep going all, sum all summer. You know, well, cell building is the last setup is June 28th, as I said. We, we, we make nukes all the way through, um, halfway through July. Um, same thing, you know, we're catching queens every four days. So every four days we have fresh queens. <clears throat> Next day we'll make uh, 50 or 60 nukes, continue with cell building. So the the her, the schedule is just very crowded. It's overcrowded. It's, it's a crazy schedule, but we do a lot with what we have. And then we're, of course, we're replacing the emerging brood with empty combs, you see. So... We took out harvesting emerging brood. We also need honey, right, for cell builders. So look, you can see what I took out of this one. I took two frames of emerging brood and one frame of honey. And so I put an empty back where I took a, a tool, where I took one. And then they'll they'll do the same thing they did before. And there may be nectar up top, there may not, but there'll probably be brood in that one. So and so on and so forth. Any foundation, you know, we're um, I'm always I'm always short on combs, as all of you are. I am sure, and part of the uh, part of the reason I'm able to do what I'm doing at the at the volume is um, that I have plenty of combs. Well, I need my bees to draw out combs, and the, the brood factories are prime examples of we need to get more room on them, even though we're pulling brood out constantly. There's plenty of frames of brood that um, when you get there, they're, they already emerged before you got back. And so the population is building all the time. And so we have to be adding, unless we're taking a lot of brood away each time, which I don't want to do because I want to keep them productive and cranking out frames of brood. So we add foundation to them. And we do the same thing we did with comb. We put the foundation in that same sweet spot right there. So, okay, so here I am. I'm going to put the fourth box on. First, I'm going to look and see if there's any uh, if there's any emerging brood. So, yep, there are. There's two frames of emerging brood right there. So we're going to put empty comb there. Then we're going to put the fourth box on. Now, again, if you put the fourth box of foundation on top, they're not going to draw it out that well. It's way up there on the top. Plus, if they do, they're going to put nectar in it. So again, you put a couple of frames of foundation in that sweet spot and, um, and the other two up top. So now you've got a four-story uh, nucleus colony. And so you see what we did. We pulled the emerging and the emerging and the empty. And so, and then you will let it go again. We come back another time. And so you see, the uh, the mixed brood when we came back it was emerging, right? That's the way it often is that the the, the sealed brood that's say purple eye and it's too young to harvest as emerging, 
by the next time you get back there, it's already emerged and it's all full of brood again. So sometimes it sometimes it's difficult to find actually emerging brood. I was really lucky that um, I when I first started this, um, I wasn't so concerned with having emerging brood. Well, I was fortunate enough in England to meet um, made a keeper David Kemp who worked with Brother Adam for ten years, and back in from sixty four to seventy four. And I was talking to him, we were having dinner, and I was talking to him, and he said, he told me, no, you, you want to put in it, you make sure it's emerging brood, because that you're trying to grow nurse bees. I said, oh, no one, yes, that's, and it, it just made so much sense, and now I can see, I can see why Adam wanted nurse bees and uh, emerging brood and not purple eye. And so this is another another um, brood factory yard. They're getting up there. They're getting up into uh, fours and five stories high. But that's where you got to go if you're going to keep them in the in the in the box. So then once the queens are uh, we we have queens ready. So if we start on May 9th, setting up the first cell builder, the first queens are ready on June 13th. That's quite that's quite a uh, time gap, but you know it's uh, you set up the cell builders and graft is in ten days, and then you graft and the heart, the cells are ripe in ten days, and you put the cells in the mate you make up the mating nukes, and you put the cells in, and the queen is ready in sixteen days. So that's sixteen twenty six thirty six days from the first from the first cell builder. So. June 13th is our traditional time to have the first uh, queen catch. Um, and then shortly after that, probably the 14th or maybe the 15th, depending on the weather, um, you know, if it's bad enough and it, we got to do it, you got to make the queens, we'll put up some canopies and make nukes and whatever we got to do, catch queens and whatever. But so once we, uh, once we have queens available, we start making nucleus colonies. And so the picture way back in the beginning, I showed you what a nucleus colony looks when it's made up. So it's, a, it's made up of a frame of honey, a frame of mixed brood. You know, it's got open brood in it, right? Cap brood and an empty comb. You got to have, when you're making these nucleus colonies, you need to have open brood. Open brood holds bees. Capped brood does not hold bees. So you can have a lot of drifting. So we're going to make 50 nucleus colonies and we're going to take them to an apiary and put them in an apiary. And if we have, all we had was, was if we had nucleus colonies in there with only capped brood, there might be some drifting. There probably would be some drifting and they'd lose population. But they're not going to lose population if they have open brood. So that's what it is. Honey mixed, capped and empty. And enough bees to cover the cap brood that cover the brood frames and onto the honey. It does not have to be overflowing with with bees, especially where I am. Early early made, two frames of brood is enough. As we get on later in the season, um, July first, say, you know, our flow ends on say the fifteenth of July. Done. And so we want these nucleus colonies to be built up enough to take advantage of the flows. They're going to come. And once we get to July 1st, we've only got two weeks before the flow is going to end. And it's going to take almost that long for them to, to hatch out that brood we gave them. So at that point, we give them three frames of brood just to boost them in strength a little bit. But that's just my uh that's just learning your uh learning your climate learning your flows and so then we're going to make uh out of this um out of this colony um we're going to make uh nucleus colonies so we have four nucleus colonies they've built themselves self up into five boxes now <clears throat> we can take the top box off there's four combs of honey so now we've got our four honeys and then we'll look for for mixed and and capped brood. Um, the empty combs will come out of my shop, <coughs> out of storage. 
So we pull out a couple frames of well covered with bees of a, a mixed end cap and put them in each one next to the honey and put the uh, empty comb in and put the cover on and put a strap around it and do another one. <clears throat> and we'll go down the rows in the in the brood factory yards, pulling honey where we can, pulling brood where we can. And when we're making nucleus colonies, you know, it's, it doesn't have to be emerging. That was for cell builders. For, for making nucleus colonies, you just need a cap brood and mixed brood and honey and an empty comb and enough bees. So it makes it a lot easier. It's a lot quicker. So we can go right down the road. We can make a we can make 50 nucleus colonies in in fairly short amount of time. We'll take them out to the, one of the nuke yards and we'll give them the uh, we'll give them uh, their queens same day. Same day. I don't wait. You don't wait till when you requeen a hive. You should never wait. You should do it right away. The longer you wait, the more difficulty uh, you'll you'll have in uh, having those queens accepted because the bees very quickly will start making their own queen cells, their emergency cells, and once they get those emergency cells along far enough, the they don't want the queen you give them. So we do it right away. Take them to the yard, put the queens in, pull the cork off the candy, and put the queens in between the combs, and come back in about ten days and check to see if she's laying and then put the second box on right then. And, um, and over the years, um, say over the last five years, um, we probably make somewhere between three, 350. So we made well over a thousand nukes in the last uh, five years. And I don't remember ever having a year where more than five queens were not accepted this way. We have very good acceptance. Part of the reason is that they don't get shipped anywhere. Part of the reason is because we have such powerful cell builders um, that the, the pheromone level of these queens, they're good stinky queens. And I think a lot of that has to do with the way they're tended to and the way they're fed by the nurse bees. And the reason is because of the, of the brood factories and boosting the population of those, uh, of those cell builders to the, to the level that you saw in that photograph. So then after we get uh, we after we get done making uh, nucleus colonies, which is going to be around the 10th of July, maybe the 15th, if we have push it a little bit. We have to do some requeening. I don't like to have. Uh, I don't like to have queens in my brood factories that are over two years old. So if we get to uh, and the queen the queen is written on all the boxes has the queen number and everything on it in the year that she was made and anything that didn't perform well during the during the summer didn't make us enough brood didn't build up early enough had any kind of issues at all um they get requeened um anything that's uh, already 2 years old they get requeened and so you know, I'm talking about strong. I'm talking about strong. I'm not talking about weak punks that need to be requeened. I'm talking about strong populous colonies that are just overflowing with bees. And so that poses a ish, an issue. Yeah, first finding the queens is an issue. But remember, there are only four combs wide. So it goes pretty well finding the queens in these things. But trying to get a strong colony to accept a new queen after you removed their laying queen poses issues you give them a queen you remove the queen and you give them a queen and a and a bent in cage in a three hole cage or or whatever kind of cage you use jz bz plastic ones or you know whatever you use that is not a laying queen there was a laying queen it's a mated queen it's not laying until she's laying and it, the, the, how fast that they shrink up. So if I catch queens, you know, I, I mark every queen I catch. We have, we catch, uh, we do 128 mating nukes a day and I, I cage and mark every single one. And if I don't like the, the shape of that, the looks of that queen, she's too small or something wrong, or I don't like it, done. Crunch, goodbye. And 
those queens are big fat ones big fat queens i bring them home put them on my uh, table in my living room tomorrow morning they're not big fat queens anymore they're they're smaller queens they're, they shrink up in one night they shrink up so now they no longer act like a laying queen so now you have to convince the the, the newly dequeened colony that they want that queen. Well, sometimes that's not easy to do. So what we do is we use the push-in cage, which is a I make them out of a eight mesh hardware cloth. They got the four sides and the top, I mean, they, and the bottom is empty. So you can push the the cage right into the mid rib of the comb. You find a comb in the in the hive that's got some emerging and some nectar. You brush all the bees off. You put the uh, you put the comb. You lay the the screen down over the spot in the comb where you want the the want it to be, and you put your queen and your new queen under it, and you push the cage into the midrib so she can't get out, and you put it back in the hive, and for four days. And you don't want bees under there because those emerging bees that are coming out now will, will have a nice little population of nurse bees under that cage who have never seen a queen. They don't, they, they don't know another queen other than the one that's under the cage. They'll feed her and tend to her and she'll start to lay right away. Then in four days, you can remove the cage. Well, four days, why four days? because sometimes there's two queens in the original hive and if you pull and if you pull that comb of that comb out with that cage on it and you see eggs outside that cage that means there's another queen in that in that nuke or in that hive whatever you're requeening but otherwise if not then you you can uh you can see the queen here here you can see her bees under there that have emerged you can see the bees on the outside of the of the screen that there you can touch them with your fingers and the, you can move them over and they're just they're happy they're they're feeding the queen the queen is walking around she's laying eggs she's been accepted and when you pull that cage off in in a minute in two minutes you see the uh, the retinue already see the retinue you know the famous retinue of the worker bees around the queen all facing towards the queen you see that in two minutes it's already she's already been accepted so that's what we, how we do our requeening and we have very good it's almost 100 percent, i would say with a push-in cage occasionally you have an issue but almost 100 percent. so then after making up nucleus colonies um we'll have something like uh like this you know like this there'll be there'll be still be some foundation in it um uh this was the last pull. Uh, there's they'll draw that foundation on the goldenrod flow. Um, when we pull the last nukes out, we try to get each brood factory down to three, maybe four frames of brood. So what do they have? One, two, three, four, four frames of brood in the bottom two boxes with enough room on for the goldenrod flow. So here's that those two foundations three foundations um and we let them go so after the uh after the golden rough flow they look something like this where they have a couple of boxes of uh honey on top and they got one two about four frames of brood down below <laughs> and so they're ready for harvest so i like to winter them in um in three boxes high not four, four is pushing it. And that much honey, two boxes of honey and those two combs right there would be overkill. They don't need all that much honey. Not, not in my climate, in your climate, forget it. <laughs> There's no way they would need that much honey. Here we need, you know, a big hive of bees need 70, 80 pounds of honey here, but, but uh, not these nucleus colonies. So anyway, we'll harvest that top box. And um, if there's no nukes in the uh, in the apiary that need that honey, we'll put it away. We'll put it in uh, in storage until until we've decided we're going to feed the nucleus colonies for winter and 
Are any of them exceptionally light? Would it be better to put one of those boxes of honey or or maybe a couple of combs, take a couple of combs out that were light and put the couple of combs of honey in them and then maybe feed them some sugar syrup? So yeah, that's how we do it. So after we get them fed, after, or after we get the uh, after we get the honey taken off, uh, we have to do something about varroa. You know that those frames of honey we take off, um, we'll extract those. If we don't need them um, to feed somebody back, we'll extract them. So we don't treat for varroa until after that's off. As soon as that comes off, we have to start doing something about varroa. Um, whether it be a miticide or, or if we can get to broodless time, I'm um, in good shape. One of the things about, uh, about nucleus colonies, about, uh, the, about these brood factories, especially, um, we're pulling frames of brood out of the brood factories all the time. And where are the mites? Where are the mites, uh, um, reproducing? in the frames of brood. So we're taking frames of brood out all the time, emerging brood that's just like, there those mites are getting ready to come out. They may not be a lot, but they're there. And they go in the cell builders. And by the time we start making nucleus colonies, we, we've got a pretty low uh, varroa count in the, in the brood factories. And, and therefore in the nucleus colonies. So for instance, uh, we made um, in our breeding program that we have going, we have two yards of 50 nucleus colonies each that we run through tests, one of which is a varroa sampling twice. And um, on the last sample, sampling in September, one of, the, one of the yards, only three had to be treated. And in the other yard, only five had to be treated. Anything over two mites, um and a sample had to be treated so that's pretty amazing and so nucleus colonies and also brood factories seem to be able to hold the 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 population of the mites down i think you know st i started this back in tracheal my time i think i'm seeing the same thing here with varroa mite the the bees outbreed in nucleus colonies the bees as long as you start with a have a brood source of that has a low mite population. I think that the bees outbreed the varroa mites. So they got more bees than the varroa mites can populate. And so you have a nice low population going into winter the first year. And then the next year, again, we have a low population because they started with a low population. Often it's not till the third year when they start to suffer. But anyway, if you can get through till broodless time, Oxalic acid and uh, sugar syrup is working very well um, to clean up any mites that might still be in the noops. Um, it's about, uh, what is it, a uh, 3.5 solution, percent solution of oxalic and, and one to one sugar syrup. Um, 50 milliliters per, per hive and five milliliters in each seam of bees, uh, one, two, three, each seam of bees. And it does quite well in cleaning up. Uh, the residual mites from your other treatments. And then in the springtime, we're using uh, these oxalic glycerin pads that Randy has been talking about. Um, lucky here in Vermont, they've approved its use. So we're allowed to legally use oxalic glycerin pads, which is pretty nice. Um, and I do think they're helping. I really do. I saw some really good results. I saw some I saw some hives in early May that just had their drone boot brood was crawling with young mites. Put these pads on. No other treatment this spring. That's it. Only these. And um, and in July there was no uh, there was no parasitic mite syndrome uh, brood, and they had sheets of nice white uh, larvae and. And I looked the other day and they did not crash. They did not have any problems with parasitic mite syndrome. But then there's other yards that did and they crashed anyway. So I think we just need to work out the kinks. 
So we're going to be working on this the next few years, and maybe Randy will come up with some uh, ideas of why that happens. But he happens to him too. He's got outliers that that never it seemed to work for them. So, but anyway, that's what we do for varroa mites. Uh, feeding for winter. Um, I keep most of my information on duct tape on top of the hive. Um, this is from 2001. So the the at the bottom. Um, it would be March 22nd of 2001. Both were okay, meaning they had enough to eat. They had a nice population of bees. Close it up and, and you know, we might have given them some pollen sub. I don't know at that point, usually. Then a month later, the left nuke has eight frames of bees and the right nuke has four frames of bees. Hmm. Kind of, uh, you know, lagging behind a little bit. On 5.13, um, so let's see if the first brood gets taken for uh, on the 9th, right? Four days later, right? I said four days, 13th, so there you go. So this is going for cell builders. The one on the right had eight frames of brood. So you turned that eight frames of bees in a, in a, she's not very long, three weeks or something, into eight frames of brood. So we took one away. They have a green dot queen. It's, we try to keep track of what's in there. The one on the right had five frames of brood, but this person decided that they should be requeened. It must have been the pattern or something. Five days later, uh, again, we put a fifth box on the left because they're really building up. Well, I guess probably so, huh? Eight frames of brood minus one is seven. Seven frames of brood in, uh, in five days is going to make it. Even five days is going to make a lot of population. So rather than having them swarm, okay. Then the one on the on the right, nobody they didn't take anything away from it. It wasn't seem didn't seem to be building up. But three weeks later, while we took two frames of brood from the left, oh my gosh, the one on the right really exploded. So we took four frames of brood, and had also has a green dot queen. So and so forth and so forth all the way through the summer, until heroes in in. July 5th, we're taking whole nucleus colonies away. One and a half nucleus colonies, one and a half nucleus colonies. We're done making nucleus colonies it's around the, the, the 20th of July. Okay, let's, it, somebody said requeen it. Let's believe what they said is true. We requeened it. We killed the queen, KQ. We gave them a daughter of breeder number 84. And she was made it in this year, 21. And then we have to look at see uh, how, how heavy the boxes are. So we pick up the top box and, uh, and heft it and say, hmm, how much would it take, uh, syrup would it take to fill that box? You know, a box, a four frame box holds around 20, I suppose, I suppose it could hold 25 pounds. Two gallons of syrup usually fills a box pretty well. So how many cans of syrup, how many gallons of syrup would it take to make that box heavy? And I go down below to the next one. How many boxes, uh, cans would it take to make this box heavy? So the top one probably needed one, the next one down needed two. That's a three total. We write, read on there, right on the tape three. And we come around to feed and we give them three, three gallons of syrup. Pretty much, it's pretty lot. You know, it's easy to pick those four comb boxes up and just heft them. So this is how we feed with paint cans. Um, there's uh, four or five uh, nail holes in the center of the lid, which is underneath, which is on the bottom. Uh, six penny nail holes. Eights are a little bit big, and they drip a bit. Sixes are excellent. And you can put up to two at once on a, on a nucleus colony. You, you know, you have the meat over the hole. The bees will go up right through that feed hole. You know, sitting on shims, so you can have a cluster of bees under the can. They go right up there, and they'll take that syrup down in, in less than a week. If it's, if it's a strong nuke, less than a week. 20 pounds of syrup, done. Something like this. Then you have to put a, a, a box around to hide it from robber bees and from, from the weather. 
we had bad robbing because of this crazy weather we've had this warm weather we had some robbing going on so we just put duct tape anywhere there's a crack where a bee could possibly get in up there and start a robbing situation we take care of it before it happens and then in this climate we have to put wrappers on because it's just this is our first snow uh this was last year it's probably sometime in november i would say and so you know these nucleus colonies they all have bottom entrances you know they got bottom entrance this one will have a bottom entrance on this side this nuke will have a bottom entrance over on the other side see and so if, if you know by by sometime in the winter the snow is usually up you know half two-thirds of the way up the up the hive the bottom entrances are all plugged with snow and ice and a night and they'll go for they'll go for four months with never having a cleansing flight and then a nice warm day presents itself in the winter time and they could take a cleansing flight but oh geez the bottom entrances are plugged with snow so they can't take a cleansing flight which they need desperately so we have number one reason is we have these upper entrances that's a it's a three quarter inch auger hole just maybe three fingers down from uh from the inner cover and they can take a cleansing flight if they get a warm day and they'll use that as their entrance also it's a it we have such a moisture issue here and because it's so cold the bees can't deal with it um the inside of the hive if if you don't have any moisture uh relief the inside of the hives gets dripping wet there's a puddle dripping out the front entrance on the bottom um even with insulation on the inner covers it just everything is soaking wet any open uh, nectar or syrup feed or anything like gets gets ridiculously thin and you hold the comb sideways and it pours out it just it's terrible but that releases that excess moisture you go out in one of these yards on a cold morning after a cold night and there'll be a horizontal icicle sticking out of those holes that shows you how much moisture vapor is leaving the hive and freezing as as it, it leaves the hive so you know a lot of people say oh don't ever have upper entrances uh why <laughs> we need one you know so there's plenty of places that don't need one but we sure as heck do so this is a yard of uh brood factories it's actually the brood factories in my mating yard in my cell building yard and um it's nice to be able to harvest brood from the brood factories and walk them across the yard and put them in uh, cell builders it's pretty nice the other one is a couple miles away so a little bit more challenging but it's basically tar paper cut to the right size snugged up tight around the hive and stapled so it won't come apart there's foam on the on the inner covers there's a piece of inch and a half or, or two inch uh building foam to insulate the uh the inner cover so we won't get any condensation dripping on the bees um the, the paper comes right up to the top of the foam and when you put the uh inner the outer cover on the lid it, you know covers up the uh, foam you tuck the paper up underneath it makes a nice seal and i tie the cover down because covers have a way of blowing off in the winter time even with stones on top so you know within minutes of of wrapping these things with this paper even on a cold day you know that's a cold day pretty cold day i took my coat off but you know i got my got my boots on i got my long underwear on you see i got long underwear on there it's cold day but there they are looking out the entrance already because of the solar gain that this paper affords us you don't need this i'm sure of it but we do so what are we doing with these bees you know we're taking this and we're taking that actually it's a whole system we build them up we start giving them more combs in the spring we build them up maybe give them some pollen substitute or something to stimulate a little brood rear and you know our our first pollen isn't until the middle of April 
So they're going all the way from the middle of October to the middle of April with no no pollen from the middle of geez, from maybe the beginning of December until sometime in April sometimes with no cleansing flight. So we're building them up and we're building them up and we start to harvest brood for cell building and we replace it with empty comb and, and we keep doing that for a while and then we start making nucleus colonies and, and then we start knocking them down. And so we built them up to, and to harvest cell builders and early nucleus colonies. Then we start knocking them down, taking what they'll give us, taking what they'll give us. And at the end, we have these three-story nucleus colonies, these perennial cell um, brood factories that have three or four frames of brood left. They build up into a beautiful population for winter. And next year, we do it again. And so they're perennial. Year after year, we have these same, these same colonies new queens surely that just keep cranking out that brood every year every year every year that i can use where i need it in my apiary and you think that all this could come from possibly come from a resource hive a single use resource hive of course not but it's all in how you manage it so it all comes from brood factories i think of it 1200 queens we raise 350 nucleus colonies um, support in other parts of my apiary the mating new so side of it if if we they get in trouble and all of it's from brood factories without my brood factories i'd be sunk you know what would i do buy bees and bought bees in 25 years so anyway thank you so much for listening Thank you. That's great. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Mm -hmm. Normally we'd open it up for a Q&A, but we're a little past time. Um, we okay. can leave the Zoom meeting open, but I'll close the recording. All and right. uh, though we're going to get kicked out of the library here in just a few minutes. But if anyone yeah. has questions and if, Mike, if you're willing to stick around yeah, for, for questions. Sure. Yep. All right. I'll leave the meeting open, but thank you everyone for coming. And thank you again, Mike. Excellent talk. Sure. Thank you. <laughs>